look in, uh, you accept that, uh, look into it means you, uh, you reflect it, you, uh, you, what you, a mirror reflects. This is what you are, this is your new self. When you find this new self, you walk in it. Uh, it walks in, it, it changes your conversation. Uh, you have new things you interest that you involve your, uh, your, 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 your uh, occupy your interest, and it changes your habits. Um, in, in your life in the world, uh, it changes your your attitude of service. Uh, that you're, you're something in you who wants to help and bless those who are in need. And this is practical Christianity. Uh, James, I take it, uh, has to write these things because somebody has to say them in practical uh, out, uh, uh, outworking. Uh, Paul does incidentally, of course, he uh, talks about husbands, wives, servants, and so on, and uh, Peter. They, to some extent, do, but uh, James hammers on this. This is his message. It has a, a, a totally practical outworking, and it's a faith where it, it's a real living faith where it has a practical outworking. Now, of course, that could run us if we didn't know better in the bondage. It doesn't run us in bondage if we know the law of liberty. If that's run you, as we see the bondage, when there are two, well, I ought to be that and I'm not. That's what the rest of we've already seen. But wisdom, I ought to, uh, uh, I ought to know I don't, what should I do and I'm all fussed up. Um, but uh, therefore, it doesn't put you in bondage when you know it, because you say, this is what I am. Don't say what I ought to be. This is what I am, this is what's happening. And where it doesn't happen, shut yourself up again, that's all. Say, oh, I'll spit to the moment, okay, that's what I am. Don't say that's what I'm that. No. So I was, I was tempted to have a double mind about that. No, I don't take that. God give me his wisdom. To keep on the I am level. That's this life, the we are level. The Christ, the we are one. This is the secret. And, um, uh, but uh, his job is uh, not saying too much about that. Other people said that, except to present it in his perfection and say, now this is how it works out. Then he goes the next, first part of the next chapter, into this question, I don't know where it's one, that it us too much, of uh, class distinction in, in, among brethren. That doesn't mean you don't respect people in their, in, their, in their titles. You respect a president, not because he's Mr. So-and-so, because he's Mr. President. That's why we have the very good title here, Mr. President. You don't respect Mr. Ford or Mr. Carter as such. It helps very much, you can respect them. We respect Mr. President. That's right. That's not, that's not a wrong character to respect to give honor to one of his due. The Bible says that. Uh, fear God, honor the kings, but you're foolish and you don't have a king. It's your fault. But uh, you have presidents and things instead. Uh, but you, you honor what you got. That's all right. That's not this at all. That's the right form because you're not honoring the person, you're honoring the uh, office. But there's another way. Uh, uh, we have, in God's view, we don't see offices. I might be respected in church at some too much, often given the elders and so on. We're getting out of that good year, I hope, today, when we're all brothers. Um, a little respect, maybe, a little, but not too much. Uh, is that right, brother? But, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. But um, uh, I don't know where this comes in. The past, they can tell better than I can. Well, there is this uh, beware against honoring too much because you've got wealth and position and family and influence. And uh, that, that poor, poor fellow, they call it used to be in slave days, we were up, up in uh, Bermuda days ago, we were seeing the original Church of England there with the galleries, you know, where the slaves were allowed and all that business. Um, and, um, uh, uh, so that's, uh, uh, but uh, I try, uh, that day has gone a good deal, possibly gone more in this country than Britain, to which I belong. But this is raised here as a question. Um, to watch against, uh, maybe pastors need to, maybe those are, that there isn't some special request, request uh, respect him because he's got the money, because he has the influence, because he's the old friend, because he's so and so. And uh, there isn't the same honor and respect for everybody equally being sons of God given to the other who hasn't got those things. It fits a little with that self image we had. Keep up your self image. Put it down if you've got uh, some ideas of your own values on earth, put them out. Uh, or come, come up if, you, if you've got a low idea of yourself and you should have a, a higher one than some of God. And here it is in, related to other people. Uh, so he speaks about that. Um, even though there was quite a thing in those days, he comes up several times over about riches. The danger of riches. He, it's quite something. He has quite a social touch in this um, uh, letter. As Jesus had too. Basically the poor. Um, 
uh, and so he brings it up, brings it up here, um, and uh, say, uh, speaks about how the rich uh, um, misuse the poor. Doesn't so much have been so. We've had that, of course. We've had slave days. We've had sweated labor days. We've gradually come out of sweated, sweated, sweated labor days. We've had uh, um, race slavery days and so on. But we're coming out a bit. But we've always more to go. It's important to ask questions in a way. These things aren't there. Um, and that's why he says, now don't now remember, he says, um, the law of scripture is you love neighbors yourself. That's the law. Um, that means you love your neighbor. You see, when I really see it, we're all one person. I am you. When I really see to the whole universe is one, and I am everything, and everything is me. It's a, a great mystery there. We haven't penetrated very far. Everything's one. I think as we understand science, we understand every thought we have touches a star. We can't understand that. We've got the speed of things have begun to touch us. We've got some idea of the speed of things, the speed of light, and so on. Even that's only on the uh, in the third dimension, because speed of light is only 186,000 miles a second. Well, that's that's peanuts in eternity. That's only in the third dimension, fourth dimension. The nearest we get is the mind. The mind is the place of the moment. That's the nearest we get to a fourth dimension being. You can be here, be there, a second. Where that happens with us as a whole, whole new men, a new dimension, we are there like that. Um, uh, like Jesus, so I'm saying, walking on the water and a uh, few things every now and then, the appearances and disappearances. Um, but uh, I'm trying to say, uh, there's a secret we've hardly begun to learn. We are actually are each other. Because all is one. That's a great help to understand. That's what Jesus said. You love your neighbor as being yourself. You love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, Jesus put, put in the terms, he said, if you don't visit a prisoner, don't visit me. You don't feed the home, you don't feed me. Don't clothe the naked, don't clothe me. And there are several of those instances in Scripture, of course, like uh, at the road to Damascus. Why persecutors are me? But Paul persecuted them and imprisoned and thought that the Christians, not Christ. But Christ and Christians are one. So if they did that, the Christians did it to Christ. So if I can begin to catch that, I'm very dimly catching it. I'm you. Now that's how my judgmentalism, because I never judge myself. I'm always nice to myself, I'm always nice to you. So, I, I, so I, if I'm as nice to you as I am to myself, I'd be pretty nice. Excuse me? When I really see that, it stops me. I do catch every now and Wait a minute, I'm that, I'm that person. Wait a minute, I'm that person. See from that point of view. Don't judge them. Take them as they are. That's what they're meant to be at the moment. And, uh, it may have those effects on them, but they're God's, sons, and I'm God's, and, and, uh, and I'm with God now, and moving in until he gets them to know they're his sons, they get as I know I'm his son. Now, that's the royal law. And of course, the moment you say, oh, uh, give us something back, but that's an important person here in the important place in, in the fellowship. You're, you're, you're not loving him uh, as you're loving your other neighbor. You're um, loving him uh, not just as a, a common self, but as a special person, he says, see? And that's why he says, don't kid yourself, all sins are like. Um, he says, uh, if you have respect to a person, you commit a sin. And you're convinced of the law as a transgressor. And then he adds, he says, he's sharp. He says, a law, any lawyer will tell you, um, if you keep the whole law to tell you one point, you're guilty of all. You're simply guilty of a broken law. Uh, therefore, he says, um, uh, 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 the person who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't kill. Uh, but if you commit adultery, you commit no adultery, do kill you the process of the law. And so he said, so speak and so do as those are judged by that law of liberty. So he said, uh, that's something for me to learn. Uh, a physical adultery isn't worse than me when I'm saying unpleasant things about people. That's something, isn't it? But uh, in God's sight, um, well, uh, uh, the, the expression of our attitudes and what may seem minor matters in God's sight, just as heinous as the murderer or the adulterer. That may help us to take some judge, judgmentalism off. Um, so he says, your standard is a perfect, your judgment is a perfect law of liberty. Judge just means God saves things from outside. It means that shows, that shows you what, it helps you. That's, that's, that's what you want. Come back, come back. It isn't, judgment isn't some awful thing. God's up here, ooh, I'm going to show you what you are. It's God's mercy saying, I come up. You slipped a moment. Okay. This is the law. This perfect love. Which uh, which is um, God, uh, you know, is in everybody, in for everybody, in, in this oneness. And this is the law, and operating on the level of it. And so if you step come up, take the judgment. 
take that as a stand, the no liberty. Um, and uh, this is where he he brings in this um, uh, this uh, famous uh, passage um, uh, uh, that uh, faith is works. Um, uh, Paul couldn't say that because Paul had to contest, co 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 uh, had to combat false works. So we build we build that life on works, self works. We carry that self works right into our, our early Christian life. Or we try to uh, uh, fight them, uh, but we're co conscious of self works. Um, and Paul had to uh, help them see that's the thing that's gone out. Um, and the law, that kind of law, which, which uh, was there to oppose me, to make me know I wasn't one, I was, that's gone out. Why has it gone out? Because it's coming. The law that has been crucified in the cross of Christ has been resurrected as me. I'm that law now. So I'm a fight. It's fine. I'm free of the minute. Uh, which came to me as an enemy when he was to show me what I couldn't do, didn't want to do. Uh, and made me guilty. And now Jesus Christ wiped out the, the guilt and the law. And the whole thing went out. Not uh, that, he, that the, uh, the law might go, come from outside into inside, I'm the law. And function as such. Therefore James could say, now then, you're the law now. Now, uh, uh, faith is, is operating on, on, the, on a given level. You're, you're functioning on a given level. Faith is, faith is being. It's mo you moved in some ways, you're being. The whole idea uh, has to go of, of faith as some kind of intellectual theory. Uh, this is the place where it differentiates between believing and, and, and faith. Uh, here it distinctly says you can believe and not have it. Because this is where he says, um, you believe as one God, you do well, the devils also believe and tremble. So it makes a differentiation in Scripture between believing and saying, really, if I'm saying I'm believing something, it's just, well, I say I believe it. Um, but uh, uh, faith is, uh, that's just an agency. Faith is a whole being involved in something. Faith is involved. All life is faith. And all, uh, and all faith is works. As I illustrated, you, we are here functioning this weekend in works because it's our faith functioning, our faith, by our faith we came here now, our faith in works. It's functioning in our cooperation and fellowship and food and everything else that's going. This is, faith is always works. Works on the level of the faith. And uh, so, uh, 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 James isn't pulling away from Paul, he's putting a copy of on Paul, he's saying what Paul wasn't there to say. Paul was there to get these tremendous bases right. Now, Paul, James comes and says, no, operate that basis. You are operating, you'll see what you are. Um, and uh, he instanced uh, uh, two involvements. <laughs> Interesting. He went to two extreme involvements. Uh, there are times where you say, when, when, uh, then we get a little more into the depths of faith, where it isn't governed by ethics. It's governed by love. And love and ethics don't always work together. Strange thing that they don't. Um, and he, the two instances he brings out of perfect faith are Abraham b uh, killing his son and Rahab lying to get the son, uh, the harlot Rahab lying to get the spies out. In both cases, God guiding a, a, a man to commit murder, to make his own son a burnt sacrifice, and to do it. In another case, guiding a, a harlot, who presumably was still a harlot, because presumably, presumably that's why the young men came to that house. She was a harlot, and yet she was a believing person. And she was the one who operated for God, and uh, opened the door for Joshua to move in and take Jericho. And start the, and start the possession of the land. Um, so here's, here, here's uh, the Holy Spirit justifying a murderer and a liar. Um, uh, it's strong. You see, don't judge. Don't judge. Um, uh, my friend, I uh, talking with Peter by this morning, for whom I get great benefits. It's not always easy to read. That's the great Kierkegaard, one of the greatest, most profound interpreters of Christianity. Some foolish men think he's wrong. He, if ever man's right, Kierkegaard's right. He knew the truth. He made that stop. He has a tremendous book on um, fear and trembling, the agony of faith. Uh, was Abraham a murderer or guided? Either he was a murderer or guided. Was he guided to murder? He did murder. Because he meant to do it. Because God had shown him, God had laid him, said, you ought to find out true life, eternal life. And you mustn't even leave your son behind with the idea, this is my son, this is... No, it's only because he's expression of eternal life. He's the, uh, the uh, transmitter of eternal life. And so, it was a taking and physically kill him and burn him up. 
and you ought to see him rise again, because the dead and the resurrection will not be that burned body, it will be my life in that body. There's a great secret for churches. Nothing in the church, it's only his life coming out. Burn the church, doesn't matter. In my mission, I've again and again said that we had that big headquarters, and uh, we had, we, they give us a magnificent, it's a 130 room magnificent headquarters in England. Uh, it's quite a centre for fellowship, so it's headquarters of our mission. <laughs> I was there at the opening, I said, oh God may well burn this up. Because that's not the point, the point was, does the Holy Spirit come out of it? That's nothing in these bricks and mortar, because they're bigger, no better than a small hut, where Stud lived in Africa. It's not that. It's just the Holy Spirit come out. And sometimes God will lead you to some extreme, so, so the world may see it. Sometimes God wants you to, as I say, destroy our beings. That's why I'm a, a church destroyer. And I say, burn the lot. <laughs> because they signify something which isn't God. Or oh, somebody yesterday was telling us, here, uh, one of your churches, where the people are so occupied in, 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 in beautifying the building. That's the thing. Oh, my dear, what's a building? Who oh, dares double stuff? So it has to come in, and we leaders have to watch this. In the Union Life, we've got to watch Union Life. What's that? Nothing. What's a magazine? Nothing. Unless it's Christ coming through, we've got to watch again become a Union Life or some of that stuff like that. Sects or something. Even in the moment they become death. And the point is, does life come out? And sometimes God will lead three ways to demonstrate that. And uh, here he led, uh, uh, and the, 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 the phrase, of course, God uses some phrases. Uh, he, in this great book, it's a wonderful book on faith, the agonies of faith. Um, what he calls um, the, 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 the night of faith, as against the night of consecration. K-N-I-G-H-T. He'd say, oh, the world, like, you know, in the old pictures of the old uh, crusaders and dedicate that sword, go and kill people, go in there. In the chapel and there, you have pictures of dedicating that sword. We all admire people who dedicate dedicating yourself. Faith is crazy. Faith isn't dedicating yourself. Faith is killing yourself. A night of faith. Abraham's a fool. Abraham. I, d- I doubt if he told his wife that one. I think he kept that privately done. Uh, Sarah knew a thing or two, but this was a high thing. A night of faith. A person who be, uh, go the absurd way. There's nothing in the glory of the flesh left that God's work comes through. That's a night of faith. That's against night of faith. Anybody will oh, look at that magnificent dedicated person. That's to yourself. But the real dedication of self was the dying of self. Jesus was the night of faith. He died a criminal. He died a failure. God, Jesus didn't leave one sex success behind on earth. His success is only in another dimension, in the resurrection. And uh, so, here God uh, uses this phrase, the, the teleological suspension of the ethical. <laughs> By which he means the fulfillment was to suspend the ethical. God's teleological is fulfillment. God's purpose is fulfilled by suspending the ethics of the ethical was don't murder your son. Uh, don't lie to hide those, fri- those, 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 those spies. Be true. Suspend the ethical. <laughs> God's purpose is come through, so you never know. So the, uh, the uh, um, lesson to us is don't judge. We had it yesterday over Samson, didn't we? Don't judge when he went and married a Philistine woman. Don't judge. Leave a person to God. Uh, if, if we think they made a mistake, let, let God take them the mistaken way. That's how they learn. And God's always beautiful, he builds up the sea, he doesn't destroy, he doesn't come to destroy, he can't verify. He builds up the mistakes, so I think. So he's saying that. Uh, and he's saying, saying to him, but, uh, um, which his whole letter is now, uh, faith is something which is producing. Well, we know that now, we don't take condemnation, this is to keep on, now we are producers, we are producers. If we're not, it's the Holy Ghost that keeps showing us, we won't get searching around for ourselves. We are producing the, Christ, the life of Christ up to like we have, okay, that's all. But he's just saying to us, that is it, that this life itself, faith is production. Faith is a new life lived, which has his inner background. And it's not the same as something which merely is mentally affirmed. Uh, it can even produce a, a trembling, like the devil's, but it's not followed through by the evolved life. Then he moves into a... Uh, well, let's have you all together the tongue. Again, the, the, the utter out, aspect. A tongue is a physical member. It expresses a mind and a spirit and a voice, a, a word. But it comes down to the tongue. He always deals on the outer level. The tongue is speaking. What the tongue produces. Because the tongue is the agent. Like we're the agent of God, the tongue is the agent of what the spirit that goes on inside me and the uh, thoughts I have and the expression that come out to my tongue. Um, he gives a little word, um, 
uh, about teachers there. Um, it's an honor to be a teacher, but he said, if you're a teacher, be sure you know what you're teaching. You see the book he puts put in there, we begin to talk about this. He says, my brethren, be not many teachers, the word here is masters, means teachers. Though you see the greater condemnation, uh, judgment, that uh, it, uh, they put in negative words, I mean, with, uh, with a greater judgment of what you teach. Um, for many things we, we make mistakes. In other words, it's a very, uh, uh, um, if you teach, know what you're teaching. That's all. Be a teacher. If you're given that, be a teacher. I, I find that very much myself. I, I, I need to know what I'm saying. If I'm mistaken, I must know I'm mistaken. I mean, I must be to me the truth, even if it's mistaken. I must give what I seem to be to. I must try and pretend something. Because I'm responsible for what I give out. Uh, uh, right here, because in those days there wasn't print. So he, he, uh, we, te we, our voice is expressed in, in books a great deal today, which couldn't be in those days. So we may say the tongue uh, in, in includes the printed words today when they stream out. Um, and he's saying there now, uh, um, uh, it's good, but he said, uh, if you are teaching, know what you're teaching. Because you, you can be, you can be picked up, you're, that's, uh, we believe in this interchange, your, your brother picked you up, are you right? Why did you say that? What proof you got of that? And you should know. And many of us who do, uh, we find that lots of us are coming, we'll be coming up, hope many of us are coming up, many of you are. Thank God, don't be afraid, don't hold back. If you've got it, give it. It's just a warning. Be sure what you're giving is what you understand to be truth, not something you just picked up and theorized. As far as you know to you, this is truth. My great friend Kierkegaard again said a word which is great to me. The truth that edifies is truth to me. The truth that, the truth that edifies, that which feeds me, that's truth to me. It may not be all truth, it might not even be truth. As far as I know, because we, we try to relate our truth to the word of God, that's why we keep the word of God, because it's our safeguard. But it, it, it was edify. I give it, oh, that's real to me. Then I give it other people. We only give what we've got, really. You know. And uh, if we give to the heart, it heart speaks to heart. And heart is edifying. If I give what's real to me, it's something that echoes in you, heart to heart. A mind bores so often, because you know it's only mind. And uh, this, this we come down into the, into the edifying. Truth that ed I like that phrase, truth that edifies is truth for me. And that's what I pass on. Then he speaks about the, uh, the, um, uh, 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 universe, the, the power of the tongue. Um, well, we all know that. I mean, we are, we are moved by tongues. We, are moved, we, are, we come here by invitation. Most life is geared to what we've heard somebody tell and advise and see. It comes from the tongue. The tongue, of course, can be devilish or heavenly, heavenly. Um, it can be stirring up hates and fears and pornography and all stuff, or it can be pointing, uh, uplifting people in truth. Um, so uh, when you look at it, most com everything comes through tongues, and so tongue, as, as he says, the tongue turns the, like the uh, the bitumen uh, in the ship, uh, the, like the rudder turns the helm, or like the bit in the horse's mouth. He says, so the tongue, the tongue is a real. Um, and then he says, he speaks of the negative, he says that there's a devastating tongue. Um, is it set on fire of hell? A tongue of fire. We get a little touch of the spirit there, because spirit is fire. God's fire. Fire isn't this thing that burns. It's just out of form. The sun's only out of form. God is fire. Life is fire. Everything is fire, really. That's why you scratch a thing into spark. It's only how, how fire hidden. The atomic fire. It's fire. Um, and uh, so, spirit is fire. And he says here, the tongue is a word of iniquity that defiles the whole body, set on fire of hell, disturbs the day, set on fire of hell. So that's very interesting, they put hell where it belongs. Hell isn't a place out there with a, a lake we can go to one day, it's here. Hell is, hell is a, 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 um, a, a condition, a spirit condition, a condition of self-service. Uh, 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 hell is, I'm for myself, I, I, therefore I'll hate this and love that and grab that and all this, all that comes out of uh, uh, self governing self, uh, uh, behind that's a spirit of hell, set on fire of hell. Because that's all hell is. Hell is merely what isn't heaven. So it's not true. The only truth in the universe is heaven. Heaven is a God who is love. Heaven, of course, is the whole thing is heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a God who expressed in love, that's heaven. And we're a heavenly people who may expression of God who is love. 
Uh, the other is not, it's, it's, it's a non riddle it's hell. Because it's geared with selfishness and hates and jealousies and fears and lusts and things that stream out of our tongues. Um, so he's saying, and then he adds, and here gets a little closer to the truth, no man can tame it. Now he's getting a little toucher there. Okay, no man can tame it. Well then he says, what do you do? He says, how he brings it out, very cleverly. He first says, this tongue stirs the world up and sets you on fire. The tongue can set the course of nature on fire, burns you up. Uh, the, thing, the angry things you said, the rotten things you said, they burn you up and burn your neighbor up and influence things and stir the world and the tongue's a, a, a devil or a, a, an angel. <laughs> and he speaks about the devil tongue here, set on fire of hell. Then he says, there's something more about tongue, you can't tame it. He says, who's ever tamed the tongue? He says, every kind of beasts and birds and serpents and things of the sea, to, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, is tamed and has been tamed to mankind. The tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Then he suddenly turns around and says, but you've got a problem. Now you have a tongue like that, you're a redeemed person, you, you were uh, uh, born of uh, the Spirit, and um, uh, begotten. Um, actually, I missed one little thing that I was going to go, when I was talking about proceeding from the being begat into the uh, law of liberty. It says, watch for the engrafted word. It's very subtly put here. I go back to there. It says, listen to the engrafted word. Now that's the inner word. So he slips in again. You move from the outer word, uh, if, uh, the word of truth, which we were begotten with the first fruit. That's wonderful. His own will he begot us. He began. Now he says, listen, don't get your own noisy tongue in the way. Don't get arguments. And don't get f rushing into forms of self and the self expressions which get in the way. Listen, listen. For the engrafted word. Uh, that's in verse 3, I've gone back there, verse 121. Uh, was in graft is put into you, it's been part of you. Now it's a worse cut to you. That's the word, that's the inner word, that's the inner Christ. That's the law of liberty. Listen to that one, move into that one. That's where he's moving into the union life. Uh, now you see, um, he, uh, he brings up this problem. Well, now what? You aren't like those, we used to be, but the tongue is just a hellish thing. But he says, we have an ambivalent tongue. We have a double tongue. He says, here, look, you know, we Christians now. Uh, we're pretty good at blessing God. We're pretty good at saying unpleasant things about man. But of course, God doesn't say unpleasant things. He only sees, he, he, God only sees blessing and cursing. The Bible never sees grey, never sees black and white. So to say an unpleasant thing is to curse him in God's sight. See, it only says here, here, thereby, uh, bless we God the Father, that we curse them, we don't go, think we curse them, but we are cursing them. Uh, we're damned with faint praise, it's cursing. Yeah, Shakespeare, he said a good thing every now and then. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, so he says, two, but what's the trouble? We do that, now what? We ourselves, we're new people, and we have a, we praise God. And of course, in this is a part of union. It took me a long time to see it. It's like that statement in the court for a long time in 1 John, where John says that uh, if a man says um, he loves God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Uh, he that loveth not his brother we hath seen, how can he love God we hath not seen? And I say that's not fair, because God's very nice and you're very nasty. And so it's quite easy for me to love God, I can't stand you, until I find your God. That's it. No. See? Then only when I say you're God, then if I don't love you, I'm not loving God because that's what God is. Ooh, that's a hot one. That's the union come out. And he said, that's the same here. He said, oh, we bless God the Father. And, ooh, I, no good, I can't stand that person. I'm cursing him. Double tongue. How's that? Now he gets to this. is where this, again, again, the subtlety comes in unspoken almost, catching the logical out to see it. Uh, and you have to go back to your answer to, to Paul, really. He says, look here. He says, how can that be? He says, you can't have a fountain sending out two waters. He says here, you can't have a fountain that sends out at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can't do it. Or he says, you can't have a fruit tree bearing olives or a vine bearing figs. So he said, a, a fountain can't put out both salt and fresh water. See the logic? You've got something wrong, you can't be both, we're not both, you see the point? You can't be both, you're not both, you're one. Come on now. 
You are one fountain. You are the new fountain. You are the fountain of the Spirit. And the pure fountain of the Spirit produces the positive word about brothers and sisters as it does the positive word about God. And therefore, the other is not the fountain. It's a little mud coming on root. As the water throw out the fountain, you've got a little muddied on root, that's all. Don't mistake the mud for the fountain. You see? Back again, find out what you are. You're not a, a double person. You've not got double partialities or double estimates about uh, uh, who people are or, or uh, double questionings about uh, God's guidance and so on. You're not a double person. You're a single person. You're in the law of liberty. And so don't say you're double. Say you've got a pure fountain, affirm that you've got a pure fountain, a fountain of love, a fountain of appreciation. And we grow into it, we grow into it, we do it, we, I think as we go on, we a little more, a little more, we... We speak positively, and I find I check myself much quicker. I'm checked much quicker than I said something. Now I know I really, uh, that's quite unnecessary to put that side or that side, because I see, I should put God's side over the person. Well, you check up. That, but that's not me. That's the, the other coming in, the false thing coming in, the double coming in through the, through the flesh, through the, uh, tempting me to say something that my outer mind sees. And my outer tongue responds, that's not I. I say, that's not I. Don't take that. If it's said, it's forgiven. Don't take it. And, and stay on the positive. You're a fountain. A fountain can only produce one kind of water. You're a tree. You only produce one kind of fruit. So you see, I catch it each time and brings it back out of the double, from the double mind, from the double... Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, is that it? All right? Uh, uh, involvement uh, into the single. Um, and then he says, and there's a, there's a heavenly wisdom and a, and, and a hellish wisdom, which comes out through the tongue. He says, have your conversation uh, in meekness of will, have a good conversation of David, and show your, uh, in, in, uh, it says, uh, now show out of a good conversation your works in meekness of wisdom, uh, heavenly wisdom. Uh, so that the, the, the outstream is mainly, it's pure, because it's genuine, it's peaceable. It's strongly, it's, it's meek, it's peaceful. It can be entreated. Uh, you can you can listen to what other people can say about what, what you're saying. It's producing peace, and it's uh, uh, sincere and honest and impartial. Um, and this that's the sweetness of heaven coming through us. That's the that's that's what's called the the uh, wisdom from above. Uh, he doesn't say the wisdom from, from he only speaks about wisdom from above. He says this wisdom. Uh, the wisdom of this from above is pure, and genuine, and peaceable, gentle, easy to be treated. That's the character. Gentle, easy, can accept words from other people and listen to what they say, uh, is genuine, is not partial, and ministers peace. This is the heavenly wisdom. And we know it in ourselves. We know it in ourselves. This is the heavenly wisdom. This is Christ in the way ways we sometimes the challenge comes but we don't live live peaceably sometimes you must move as we see in Second Corinthians sometimes you have to move to challenge but you don't live even then you do it with tears as it were even then the point isn't the challenge so much as the love but this is the heavenly wisdom and we know it ourselves he says there's another kind of wisdom he doesn't give it he just said that, 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 that it doesn't descend it doesn't descend from above it doesn't tell anymore it just doesn't descend that's where that's, well, there's um, the bitter envying and strife. What strife? We know it. Uh, when we, uh, what's his arguments? Envying is a bad word. Because we have it more than we think. I'm not so conscious of that one. Envying, uh, that, uh, um, uh, because uh, basically we uh, feel somebody else got more than we have or something. So that doesn't come and produces the, the discord. And so the real is the concord and the discord, isn't it? Generally speaking, uh, ours is a, is a word of concord, of peace, love. The other word is discord. Watch it, watch it. And they say that produces uh, 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 peaceable fruits. By uh, uh, operating on the peace level, we produce, we, we produce a, a flow of life. Um, uh, the fruit of righteousness is shown by that, uh, meaning that uh, there's, there's harmony. Um, so that's what he said about tongue. Um, how about it? Well, I better try. I don't know. But there's a little more to say. We stop there for a moment. A uh, little more to do on James covering the last 
two chapters. Um, apparently among the believers uh, there's a great deal of um, worldly greed and competition going on. We'd almost think it's strange, because we shouldn't. Uh, perhaps I live in a kind of atmosphere where I don't meet that as it is, but here it was, and he was speaking to the believers and said, you get fighting among yourselves because you, 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 you have desires, you want certain things, and you desire them and you can't get them, and then you even kill to get them. So you might kill a person's reputation as well as their body to get them. And then you can't get them, and then you get fighting, and uh, uh, then you, you haven't got them because you ask, because you don't ask, then you can't get them when you do ask, you ask for wrong motives. A pretty gloomy picture. That's these first four verses of chapter three, because you're uh, out for your own self-interest. Of course, that wasn't true, you see. It's always the same thing. It's how they were captured by the flesh. And this, but apparently the flesh is operating, perhaps it does on some. So we have uh, desires, earthly desires, and, and uh, uh, ambitions, and covetousness, and des- uh, for this and that, and even, uh, even uh, uh, use, uh, get fighting our, fighting our neighbors about them, whether it was in church affairs or not, I wouldn't say so here, and, um, uh, and even using prayer as a means for getting what I want. This isn't a, 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 a fact passage on the technique of prayer, it's only on the misuse of prayer. Um, and then he comes right out and says, you see, uh, if you have any other love but Jesus, you're an adulterer. Straight out. This is where he says, you are adulterer, you adulterers, adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever that was a friend of the world is enemy of God. No two measures. Um, so there's only one love. Your love isn't your husband or your wife or your children. It's only Jesus. It's only them as they're given to you by Jesus as, as forms which you can love, persons you can love. You know, we've got the soul lover and the soul uh, involvement in life. That's Jesus, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. If you have any rival love, it's an adultery. If you give way to it, of course, you can be tempted. There again, it doesn't touch that, but uh, uh, it doesn't even imply, it implies that they went much farther than temptation here. And you should be going in for things which were... were um, um, divided the uh, objectives in life. As he says, so, uh, get it clear, you can't have two loves. You can't love Jesus and then have, really be grabbed by some love of this, of this world. Maybe to do with finances or position or persons or family. You can't have it. So it's drastic. If you've got any other love, it's a rival of Jesus, you're an adulterer. You're, 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 you're having an affair with another woman. You can't have that. So that's strong measure, isn't it? So perhaps we need it, even though we may say we don't seem to fit in exactly into fighting to get some personal end, yet you never know in life. For, uh, a better money in business or better salary or bypassing this person or downgrading that person to be able to slip into his position. So these things can rise in subtle forms, can't they? Uh, or, of course, uh, in friendships, rival because somebody wants to cut somebody else out for friendship. Or, or, uh, as I say, even even the, uh, the wife and husband and the children taking uh, to uh, a place which only belongs to Jesus, as an as a, as a exclusive place for Jesus. Well, of course, if you're in union, you must have that. For you, is that. You, if you're not you, so poor you. If you're not you, but you're Christ in you, you're finished. That, that you, are, you, are, you are that love. It isn't, a, it isn't really love with a person. It's like you are that person. It's this. Uh, I admit the duality in the unity is that when you have the unity, he is like you love him too. Is uh, people who don't know you get mistaken about that. They say, well, yeah, but I, uh, I have God, and I'm going to meet him face to face, and Jesus, how can I say I'm one? You can't say it, you won't know it. But uh, it's, of course, the same principle of Trinity. How is Trinity one and yet three? They're one, yet they're three, yet they're one. So you can't argue with those who don't know duality. You only say, they can only pick something up from you which you know. That this is your, your, your center of your peace and your, your, your sufficiency and all. I'm not I. I'm this person lived through me. Uh, and therefore, of course, I only have one love. <laughs> because I am that love. I'm mixed up in it. I can't have a rival love. I may be tempted. I can't have it. If I don't know that, I can have rival loves. That's what you're getting at here. You're getting at those who have this divided outlook. I haven't recognized that, isn't it, that they died out it's a false thing. It was crucified with Christ. It's not real. We, uh, they of, Christ, of, 
Christ has crucified the flesh with his affection for love. Uh, God forbid that you always say the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby I am crucified the world, the world of me. I am crucified. John, uh, Galatians 3 times over said, I am crucified, the world's crucified, and I've crucified the flesh. So, then that's not real. What's crucified isn't, isn't real to me, it's way up there. So, it's a, it's a, a falsely rival love, but it doesn't appear rival until I know this union. Then I say, ah, oh, I'm not that. So again you come back, the only answer is to know the union. And because they didn't know you, and they were being caught up by some of these things, and to some extent they were uh, involved in uh, uh, rival loyalties and uh, even twisty ways of doing things and gaining things, uh, which, uh, by which they can be said you're an adulterer, you, you're in love with another woman, that woman is the world. So it's good for us not to be searched, because we, I trust that we've been searched, but to say, hey, I'm not, I don't accept that. Uh, I may have had temptations that way, I don't accept that. Or, uh, we can appear to be caught out, it's the appearance really, we may be real to us. We may really have a rival love and do battle with it. And our trouble is doing battle with it, of course, because we're mistaken an illusion for reality. So it is possible, if we don't know the union, that we are grabbed by uh, uh, rival affection, uh, a rival anything, and uh, we know that. Uh, I've known that, I've known that, but don't, don't take it. The point is, you take it, you fight, you fight it, you take it. There it is. And um, you say, no, that's, that's not real. I just don't, that's not, the, I only have one love, there's God. And, uh, my love is to love people for their sake, not for my sake. Or to love things for the advantage, not for my advantage, for uh, others' advantage. Then you're free. Because you're, the other love's always free. Um, so it may be, and, and they evidently were caught up by rival loves and didn't know how to fight them, and they had to admit, falsely admit, that they were slaves, adulterers, slaves to rival love. And so, in this case, uh, um, James does do it pretty drastically. And he says, I've got to be exposure and cleansing and humbling and crying out to God. Um, he says, uh, Don't you know the, the spirit that dwells in you lusted to envy? It's a queer phrase, and there are two interpretations. One is that it's our spirits lusting for what they shouldn't. I don't think that's right. He says, Don't you know the spirit of God in you lusting to get you right? He, he, he's jealous for you being wrong. And he's there working on you, I like that much more. It's, don't you know the Spirit of God working on you to, to deliver you from these false things? Um, and, then, and then he says, it's there because there's, God gives abundance of grace. Um, God, uh, he says, he gives more grace, abundance of grace. And again, the second group, uh, second area of grace, he says, God, plenty of grace for God, of course, is not explained. The grace we know is to be brought into the uh, recognition, affirmation of the union, the, the realization of the union, the, then the illusion of the other. It's just in the cross. But they, he doesn't explain that. He said, but God does give grace. He said, he, and um, he's but you've got to humble yourself. You, all right? We we'll hope as believers they were humble. We hope that they were, no, it doesn't imply they were. But they knew they had no business to have these rival loves. So uh, God was just the proud. But if you come down and say, yeah, I shouldn't have it, now you're starting. Then you submit to to God, and they say, if you do that, the devil, you resist the devil, because the submission is the resistance. When you can't see two ways, you submit yourself to God, you can't resist the devil, not busy, you don't see him, he's gone. So the devil's out. He was put out by, he's, he's, uh, put out, uh, 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 his works were destroyed by Jesus Christ. And uh, so we're not, we have nothing to say to the devil, he's out. Uh, but we, we resist him by affirming who we are, not by fighting him. The more you fight the thing, the more you make it real. We resist, the more you resist the thing, the more you affirm it. That's why you don't answer temptation by resisting it. You say, no, uh, uh, it's not there. Um, uh, that's why I use that, that phrase that Jesus used in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says, if, you, um, uh, um, uh, if uh, your adversary, he says, agree with your adversary quickly, why is he in the way with you? Your adversary is someone opposing you. Because you don't reveal, uh, agree with him, he'll grab you and put you in prison until you pay the utmost farming. And the idea is, if you if you um, uh, fight your adversary your, and your temptation, uh, something that grabs you, you fight him, he gets you. This is the end of tape one. Please continue to tape two. Oh, our hearts are purified. But they've got to find out. They've got to go this way, maybe in a period where they've got to get things cleaned up. We've got to cry to God. It is why he says, stop, stop being happy. He's strong. He says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Stop your laughter. Turn your laughter into mourning and your joy to heaven. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he lift you up. 
So there are areas sometimes that people have to do business. That there are black Look in, uh, you accept that. Uh, uh, look into it means you, uh, you reflect it. You, uh, you, what you, a mirror reflects. This is what you are. This is your new self. When you find this new self, you walk in it. Uh, it walks in, it, it changes your conversation. Uh, you want new things you interest to divulge your, uh, your, 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 your the occupy interest, and it changes your habits um, in, in your life in the world, and it changes your your attitude of service, uh, that you're, you're something in you who wants to help and bless those who are in need. And this is practical Christianity. Uh, James, I take it, uh, has to write these things because somebody has to say them in practical uh, out, uh, uh, outworking. Uh, Paul does incidentally, of course, he uh, uh, talks about husbands, wives, servants, and so on, and uh, Peter. They, to some extent, do, but uh, James hammers on this. This is his message. It has a, a, a totally practical outworking, and it's a faith, when it, it's a real living faith, when it has a practical outworking. Now, of course, that could run us if we didn't know better in the bondage. It doesn't run us in bondage if we know the law of liberty. It does run you, as we see in the bondage, when there are two, well, I ought to be that and I'm not. That's what the rest of we've already seen. But wisdom, I ought to, uh, uh, I ought to know I don't, what should I do, and I'm all fussed up. Uh, but, uh, therefore, it doesn't put you in bondage when you know it, because you say, this is what I am. Don't say what I ought to be. This is what I am, this is what's happening. And where it doesn't happen, catch yourself up again. That's all. Say, oh, I sit to moment. Okay, that's what I am. Don't say that's what I'm that. No. So I was, I was tempted to have a double mind about No, I don't take that. God give me his wisdom. To so keep on the I am level. That's this life. The we are level. The Christ, the we are one. This is the secret. And, um, uh, but uh, his job is uh, not saying too much about that. Other people said that. Except to present it is perfection and say, now this is how it works out. Then he goes the next, first part of the next chapter, into this question, I don't know whether it's one that concerns us too much, of uh, class distinction in, in, among brethren. That doesn't mean you don't respect people in their, in, their, in their titles. You respect a president, not because he's Mr. so but because he's Mr. President. That's why we have a very good title here, Mr. President. You don't respect Mr. Ford or Mr. Carter as such. It helps very much, you can respect them. We respect Mr. President. That's right. That's not, that's not a wrong character to respect to give honor to one of his due. The Bible says that. Uh, fear God, honor the kings, but you're foolish and you don't have a king. It's your fault. But uh, you have presidents and things instead. Uh, but you, you honor what you got. That's all right. That's not this at all. That's the right form because you're not honoring the person, you're honoring the uh, office. But there's another way. Uh, uh, we have, in God's kingdom, heaven, we don't see offices. I might be respected in church at some too much often given the elders and so on. We're getting out of that good year, I hope, today, when we're all brothers. Um, little respect may be, but not too much. Uh, is that right, brother? But, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. But um, uh, I don't know where this comes in. The past, I can tell better than I can. Well, there is this uh, beware against honoring too much because you've got wealth and position and family and influence. And uh, let that poor, poor fellow, they call it, used to be in slave days, we were up, up in uh, Bermuda there to go, we were seeing the original Church of England there with the galleries, you know, where the slaves were allowed and all that business. Um, and, um, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, but uh, I try, uh, that day has gone a good deal, possibly gone more in this country than Britain, to which I belong. But it is raised here as a question. Um, to watch against, uh, maybe pastors need to, maybe those are, that there isn't some special request, request uh, respect him because he's got the money, because he has the influence, because he's the old friend, because he's so and so. And uh, there isn't the same honor and respect as for everybody equally being sons of God given to the other who hasn't got those things. It fits a little with that self image we had, keep up your self image. Put it down if you've got uh, some ideas of your own values on earth, put them out. Uh, or come, come up if, you, if you've got a low idea of yourself and you should have a, a higher one than some of God. And here it is in, related to other people. Uh, so he speaks about that. Um, even though it was quite a thing in those days, he comes up several times over about riches. The danger of riches. He, it's quite something. He has quite a social touch in this. 
um, uh, letter, as Jesus had too, especially for the poor. Um, uh, and so he brings it up, brings it up here, um, and uh, say, uh, speaks about how the rich may uh, um, misuse the poor. It not so much have been so. We've had that, of course. We've had slave days. We've had sweated labor days. We've gradually come out of sweated, sweated, sweated labor days. We've had uh, um, race slavery days and so on. But we're coming out a bit. But we've always more to go. It's important to ask Christians in a way. These things aren't there. Um, and that's why he says, now don't, now remember, he says, um, the law of scripture is you love neighbors yourself. That's the law. Um, that means you love your neighbor. You see, when I really see it, we're all one person. I am you. When I really see to the whole universe is one, and I am everything, and everything is me. It's a, a great mystery there. We haven't penetrated very far. Everything's one. I think as we understand science, we understand every thought we have touches a star. We can't understand that. We've got the speed of things have begun to touch us. We've got some idea of the speed of things, the speed of light, and so on. Even that's only on the, uh, in the third dimension. Because the speed of light is only 186,000 miles a second. Well, that's, that's peanuts in eternity. That's only in the third dimension, fourth dimension. The nearest we get to the mind, the mind is the place of the moment. That's the nearest we get to the fourth dimension of being. You can be here, be there in a second. Where that happens with us as a whole, whole new men and new dimension, we are there like that. Um, uh, like Jesus, I'm saying, walking on the water and a uh, few things every now and then, the appearances and disappearances. Um, but uh, I'm trying to say, uh, there's a secret we've hardly begun to learn. We are actually are each other. Because all is one. That's a great help to understand. That's what Jesus said. You love your neighbor as being yourself. You love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, Jesus put, put in the terms, he said, if you don't visit the prisoner, you don't visit me. You don't feed the hungry, you don't feed me. Don't clothe the naked, don't clothe me. And there are several of those instances in scripture, of course, like uh, at the road to Damascus. Why persecutest thou me? But Paul persecuted them and imprisoned and sought at the Christians, not Christ. But Christ and the Christians are one. So if they did that to the Christians, they did it to Christ. So if I can begin to catch that, I'm very dimly catching it. I'm you. Now that's not my judgmentalism, because I never judge myself. I'm always nice to myself, I'm always nice to you. So, I, I, so I, if I'm as nice to you as I am to myself, I'd be pretty nice. Excuse me? When I really see that, it stops me. I do catch him in the eyes. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm that person. Wait a minute, I'm that person. See from that point of view. Don't judge him. Take him as they are. That's what they're meant to be at the moment. And, uh, it may have those effects on them, but they're God's, sons, and I'm God's, and, and, uh, and I'm with God now, and moving in until he gets them to know they're his sons, they get as I know I'm his son. Now, that's the royal law. And of course, the moment you say, oh, uh, give us something back, but that's an important person here in the important place in the, in the fellowship. You're, you're, you're not loving him as, uh, as you're loving other neighbor. You're um, loving him uh, not just as a, a common self, but as a special person, he says, sin. And that's why he says, don't kid yourself, all sins are like. Um, he says, uh, if you have respect to a person, you commit a sin. And you're convinced of the law as a transgressor. And then he adds, he says, he's sharp. He says, a law, any law will tell you, um, if you keep the whole law to any one point, you're guilty of all. You're simply guilty of a broken law. Uh, therefore, he says, um, uh, 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 the person who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't kill. Uh, but if you commit adultery, you commit no adultery, do kill us the process of the law. And so he said, so speak and so do as those are judged by that law of liberty. So he said, uh, that's something for me to learn. Uh, a physical adultery isn't worse than me when I'm saying unpleasant things about people. That's something, isn't it? But uh, in God's sight, um, well, uh, uh, the, the expression of our attitudes and what may seem minor matters in God's sight, just as heinous as the murder of the adulterer. That may help us to take some judge, judgmentalism off. Um, so he says, your standard is a perfect, your judgment is a perfect law of liberty. Judge just means God saves things from outside. It means that shows, that shows you what, it helps you. That's, that's, that's what you are. Come back, come back. It isn't, judgment isn't some awful thing. God's up here, ooh, I'm going to show you what you are. It's God's mercy saying, I come up. You sit a moment. Okay. This is the law. This perfect love. Uh, which is um, God ex 
uh, you know, is, in, in everybody, in for everybody in, in this oneness. And this is the law, operating on the level of it. And so if you step come up, take the judgment. Take that as a stand, the law of liberty. Um, and uh, this is where he he brings in this um, uh, this uh, famous uh, passage um, uh, uh, that uh, faith is works. Um, uh, Paul couldn't say that because Paul had to contest, co- 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 had to combat false works. So we build we build that life on works, self works. We carry that self works right into our, our early Christian life. Or we try to uh, uh, fight them, uh, but we're kind of self works. Um, and Paul had to uh, help them see that's the thing that's gone out. Um, and the law, that kind of law, which, which uh, was there to oppose me, to make me know I wasn't one, I was, that's gone out. Why has it gone out? Because it's coming. The law that has been crucified in the cross of Christ. I've been resurrected as me. I'm that law now. So I'm a fight. It's fine. I'm free of the minute. Uh, which came to me as an enemy when he was to show me what I couldn't do, didn't want to do. Uh, and made me guilty. And now Jesus Christ wipes out the, the guilt and the law. And the whole thing went out. Not uh, that, he, that the, uh, the law might go, come from outside into inside. I'm the law. And function as such. Therefore James could say, now then, you're the law now. Now, uh, uh, faith is, is operating on, on, the, on a given level. You're, you're functioning on a given level. Faith is, faith is being. It's mo- you moved in some ways, you're being. The whole idea uh, has to go of, of faith as some kind of intellectual theory. Uh, this is the place where it differentiates between believing and, and, and faith. Uh, here it distinctly says you can believe and not have it. Because this is where he says, um, you believe as one God, you do well, the devils also believe and tremble. So it makes a differentiation in Scripture between believing in the sense, really, if I'm saying I'm believing something, it's just, well, I say I believe it. Um, but uh, uh, faith is, uh, that's just an agency. Faith is a whole being involved in something. Faith is involved. All life is faith. And all, life, and all faith is works. As I illustrated, you, we are here functioning this weekend in works because it's our faith functioning, our faith, by our faith we came here now, our faith in works. It's functioning now for cooperation and fellowship and food and everything else is going. This is faith, it always works. Works on the level of the faith. And uh, so, uh, 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 James isn't pulling away from Paul, he's putting a copy so on Paul, he's saying what Paul wasn't there to say. Paul was there to get these tremendous bases right. Now, Paul, James comes and says, operate that basis. You are operating, you'll see what you are. Um, and uh, he instances. Uh, uh, two involvements, <laughs> interesting. He went to two extreme involvements. Uh, there are times where you say, when, when, uh, then we get a little more into the depth of faith, where it's not governed by ethics. It's governed by love, and love and ethics don't always work together. Strange thing that they don't. Um, and the two instances he brings out of perfect faith are Abraham b- uh, killing his son, and Rahab lying to get the spies, uh, the harlot Rahab lying to get the spies out. In both cases, God guiding a, a, a man to commit murder, to make his own son a burnt sacrifice, and to do it. Another case, guiding a, a harlot, who presumably was still a harlot, because presumably, presumably that's why the young men came to that house. She was a harlot, and yet she was a believing person. And she was the one who operated for God, and uh, opened the door for Joshua to move in and take Jericho, and stop the, and, and stop the possession of the land. Um, so here is here, here's, uh, the Holy Spirit justifying a murderer and a liar. Um, uh, it's strong. You see, don't judge. Don't judge. Um, uh, my friend, I uh, was talking with Peter Biden this morning, for whom I get great benefit. It's not always easy to read. That's the great Kierkegaard, one of the greatest, most profound interpreters of Christianity. Some foolish men think he's wrong. He, if ever a man's right, Kierkegaard's right. He knew the truth. He made that stop. He has a tremendous book on um, fear and trembling, the agony of faith. Uh, was Abraham a murderer or guided? Either he was a murderer or guided. Was he guided to murder? He did murder. Because he meant to do it. Because God had shown him, God had named him, said, you ought to find out true life, eternal life. 
And you must even leave your son behind with the idea, this is my son, this is... No, it's only because he's special of eternal life. He's the, uh, the uh, transmitter of eternal life. And so, you are to take him and physically kill him and burn him up. And you ought to see him rise again, because then the resurrection will not be that burned body. It will be my life in that body. There's a great secret for churches. Nothing in the church. It's only his life coming out. Burn the church, doesn't matter. In my mission, I've again and again said that we had that big headquarters and uh, we had, we, they give us a magnificent, the 130 room magnificent headquarters in England. Uh, it's quite a centre for fellowship, so it's headquarters of our mission. <laughs> I was there at the opening, I said, oh God, may well burn this up. But that's not the point. The point was, does the Holy Spirit come out of it? That's not in these bricks and mortar. Look, they're big, they're no better than a small hut. We're studying in Africa. It's still bad. It's not the Holy Spirit come out. And sometimes God will lead you to some stream, so, so the world may see, sometimes God wants to, as I say, destroy our beings. That's why I'm a, a church destroyer. I say, burn the lot. <laughs> because they signify something which isn't God. Or oh, something yesterday was telling us. Here, uh, one of your churches, where the people are so occupied in, 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 in beautifying the building. That's okay. Oh, my dear, what's a building? Who oh, dares double stuff? So it has to come in, and we leaders have to watch this. Yeah, in the Union Life, got to watch Union Life. What's that? Nothing. What's a magazine? Nothing. Unless it's Christ coming through, we've got to watch again because Union Life or some of stuff like that. Sex or something. Anyway, the moment they become dead. And the point is, does life come out? And sometimes God will lead three ways to demonstrate that. And uh, here he led, uh, uh, and the, 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 the phrase, of course, clearly God uses some phrases. Uh, he, in this great book, it's a wonderful book on faith, the agonies of faith, um, what he calls um, the, 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 the night of faith as against the night of consecration, K-N-I-G-H-T. He said, oh, the world, like you know, in the old pictures of the old uh, crusaders who dedicate their thought to go kill people, go in, there. in the chapel day, you have pictures of dedicating their thought. We all the my people to dedicate, dedicate yourself. Faith is crazy. Faith isn't dedicating yourself. Faith is killing yourself. A night of faith. Abraham's a fool. Abraham. I doubt, I doubt if he told his wife that one. I think he kept that private thing done. Uh, hell, I knew a thing or two, but this was a high thing. A night of faith. A person who be, uh, goes the third way. There's nothing in the glory and the flesh left that God's work comes through. That's a night of faith. That's a great night of faith. Anybody will oh, look at that magnificent dedicated person. That's to yourself. But the real dedication of was the dying of self. Jesus was a night of faith. He died a criminal. He died a failure. God, Jesus didn't leave one sex success behind on earth. His success is only in that dimension, in the resurrection. And uh, so, here God uh, uses this phrase, the, the teleological suspension of the ethical. <laughs> By which he means the fulfillment was to suspend the ethical. God's teleological is fulfillment. God's purpose is fulfilled by suspending the ethical. The ethical was, don't murder yourself. Uh, don't lie to hide those spies. Those, 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 those Be true. Suspend the ethical. That's <laughs> what You never know. So the, uh, the uh, uh, lesson to us is don't judge. We had it yesterday over Samson, didn't we? Don't judge when he went married a finish sign woman. Don't judge. Leave a person to God. Uh, if, if we think they made a mistake, let, let God take them in a mistaken way. That's how they learn. And God's always beautiful, he builds up the sin, he doesn't destroy, he doesn't come to destroy, he can't verify. He builds up the, the mistakes. So, I mean. so he's saying that. Uh, and he's saying, saying to him, but, uh, um, which his whole letter is now, uh, faith is something which he's producing. Well, we know that now, we don't take condemnation. This is to keep on now, we are producers. We are producers. If we're not, it's the Holy Ghost better get showing us. We won't get searching around for ourselves. We are producing the Christian life of Christ up like we have, okay, that's all. But he's just saying to us, that is it, that this life itself, faith is production. Faith is a new life lived, which has his inner background. And it's not the same as something which merely is mentally affirmed. Uh, can even produce a, a trembling like the devil's, but it's not followed through by the evolved life. Then he moves into a... Uh, now that's something you want to go with the tongue. Again, the, the, the utter out, aspect. A tongue is a physical member. It expresses a mind and a spirit and a voice and a word. So it comes down to the tongue. He always gives it on the upper level. The tongue is speaking. What the tongue produces. 
because the tongue is the agent, like we are the agent of God, the tongue is the agent of what the spirit of God inside me and the uh, thoughts I have and the expression that come up from my tongue. Um, he gives a little word um, uh, about teachers there. Um, it's an honor to be a teacher, but he says, you're a teacher, be sure you know what you're teaching. He says, the book he puts put in there, we begin to talk about this. He says, my brethren, be not many teachers, the word here is masters, means teachers. They which seem greater condemnation, uh, judgment, uh, it, uh, they put in negative words, they mean with, with a greater judgment than what you teach. Um, for many things we, we make mistakes. In other words, it's a way of a, a um, if you teach, know what you're teaching. That's all. Be a teacher. If you're given that, be a teacher. I, I find that very much myself. I, I, I need to know what I'm saying. Whether I'm mistaken, I must know I'm mistaken. I mean, I must be to me the truth, if it's mistaken. I must give what I seem to be to. I must try and pretend something. Because I'm responsible for what I give out. And uh, right here, because in those days there wasn't print. So it, it, uh, we, te we, our voice is expressed in, in books a great deal today, which couldn't be in those days. So we may say the tongue uh, in, in includes the printed words today when they stream out. Um, and he's saying there now, uh, um, uh, it's good, but he says, uh, if you are teaching, know what you're teaching. Because you, you could be, you could be picked up, you know, that's, uh, we believe in it, interchange. Your, your brother picked you up, are you right? Why'd you say that? What proof you got of that? And you should know. And many of us who do, uh, we find that lots of us are coming, we'll be coming up, hope many of us are coming up, many of you are. Thank God, don't be afraid, don't hold back. If you've got it, give it. It's just a warning. Be sure what you're giving is what you understand to be truth, not something you just picked up and theorized. As far as you know, to you, this is truth. My great friend Kierkegaard again said a word which is great to me. The truth that edifies is truth to me. The truth that, the truth that edifies, that which feeds me, that's truth to me. It may not be all truth, it might not even be truth. As far as I know, because we try to relate our truth to the Word of God, that's why we keep the Word of God, it's our safeguard. But it, it, it was edify. I give, oh, that's real to me, that's good to other people. We only give what we've got, really, you know. And uh, if we give to the heart, it heart speaks to heart. And heart is edifying. If I give what's real to me, it's something that echoes in you, heart to heart. A mind bores so often, because you know it's only mind. And uh, this necessarily come down into the, into the edify, truth that ed I like that phrase, truth that edifies is truth for me. And that's what I pass on. Then he speaks about the, uh, the, um, uh, 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 um, universe, the, the power of the tongue. Um, well, we all know that. I mean, we are, we are moved by tongue. We're, we're, we come here by invitation. Most life is geared to what we've heard, somebody tell and advise and see. It comes from the tongue. The tongue, of course, can be devilish or heavenly. heavenly. Um, it can be stirring up hates and fears and pornography and all stuff. Or it can be pointing, uh, uplifting people in truth. Um, so uh, when you look at it, most come, everything comes through tongues. And so tongue, as, as he says, the tongue turns the, like the uh, the bitumen uh, in the ship, uh, the, like the uh, rudder turns the helm, or like the bit in the horse's mouth, he says. So the tongue, the tongue is very real. Um, and then he says, he speaks of the he says that there's a devastating tongue. Um, is it set on fire of hell, a tongue of fire? We get a little touch of the spirit there, because spirit is fire, God's fire. Fire isn't this thing that burns, it's just out of form, it sounds like out of form. God is fire. Life is fire. Everything is fire, really. That's why you scratch the thing into spark. It's only how, how far hidden. The atomic fire. It's fire. Um, and uh, so, spirit is fire. And he says here, the tongue, the word of iniquity, that defiles the whole body, set on fire of heaven, disturbs the day, set on fire of hell. So that's very interesting. They put hell where it belongs. Hell isn't a place out there with a, a, a lake which goes to one day. It's here. Hell is, hell is a, 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 um, a, a condition, a, 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 a spirit condition, a condition of self uh, 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 Hell is, I'm for myself, I, I, therefore I hate this and love that and grab that and all this, all that comes out of uh, uh, self-governance, self, uh, and behind that's a spirit of hell. Self-unvowed hell. 
Because that's all hell is. Hell is merely what is in heaven. So it's not true. The only truth in the universe is heaven. Heaven is a God who is love. Heaven, of course, is the whole thing is heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a God who is in love. That's heaven. And we're a heavenly people who make expression of God as love. Uh, the other is not, it's, it's, it's a non, really, it's hell. Uh, because it's geared in selfishness and hates and jealousies and fears and lusts and things that stream out of our tongues. Um, so he's saying, and then he adds, he gets a little closer to the truth. No man can tame it. Now he's getting a little touch of that. Okay, no man can tame it. Well, then he says, what do you do? He says, how big is how? Very cleverly. He first says his tongue stirs the world up and sets you on fire. The tongue can set the course of nature on fire, burns you up. Uh, the, thing, the angry thing you said, the rotten things you said, they burn you up and burn your neighbor up and influence things and stir the world. And the tongue's a, a, a devil or a, an angel. <laughs> he speaks about the devil tongue here, set on fire of hell. Then he says, there's something more about tongue, you can't tame it. He says, who's ever tamed the tongue? He says, every kind of beasts and birds and serpents and things of the sea, to, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, is tamed, and has been tamed to mankind, the tongue can no man tame. It's not only evil, full of deadly poison. Then he suddenly turns around and says, but you've got a problem. Now you have a tongue like that, you're a demon person, you, you were uh, uh, born of the uh, spirit, and um, uh, be begotten. Um, Actually, I missed one little thing that uh, uh, we're not talking about proceeding from the being the begat into the uh, law of liberty. It says, watch for the engrafted word. It's very subtly put here. Go back to that. It says, listen to the engrafted word. Now that's the inner word. So he slipped in again. You move from the outer word, uh, at, at the word of truth, which we were begotten as the first sweet. That's wonderful. His own will he begot us. He began. Now I said, listen, don't get your own noisy tongue in the way, don't get arguing with them, don't get rushing into forms of self and the self-expressions which get in the way. Listen, listen, for the engrafted word, uh, that's in verse, I've gone back there, verse 121, uh, the word engrafted put into you, it's been part of you, now the word's cut to you, that's the word, that's the inner word, that's the inner Christ, that's the law of liberty. Listen to that one, move into that one. That's where he's moving into the union life. Uh, now, you see, um, he, uh, he brings up this problem. Well, now what? You aren't like those, we well, used to be, but the tongue is just a hellish thing. But he said, we have an ambivalent tongue. We have a double tongue. He says, here, look, you know, we Christians now. Uh, we're pretty good at blessing God. We're pretty good at saying unpleasant things about man. But, of course, God doesn't say unpleasant things. He only sees, he, he, God only sees blessing and cursing. The Bible never sees grey, never sees black and white. So to say an unpleasant thing is to curse them in God's sight. See, they, they always says here, here, thereby uh, bless we God the Father, that we curse them, we don't go think we curse them, but we are cursing them. Uh, we dab with faint praise, it's cursing. That's Shakespeare, he said good things every now and then. Um, uh, so, you know, that's, so he says those two, but what's the trouble you, we do that, now what? We ourselves, we're new people, and we have a, we praise God. And of course, this is a part union. It took me a long time to see it. It's like that statement in, the court was a long time in 1 John, where John says that uh, if a man says um, he loves God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Uh, he that loves not his brother we have seen, how can he love God we have not seen? And I think that's not fair, because God's very nice and you're very nasty. So it's quite easy to love God, I can't stand you. Until I find your God. That's it. No. See? Then only when I say you're God, then if I don't love you, I'm not loving God, because that's what God is. Ooh, that's a hot one. That's the union come out. And he says, that's the same here. He says, oh, we bless God the Father. And ooh, I, don't good, I can't stand that person. I'm cursing him. That we come. How's that? Now he gets them. This is where this, again, again, the subtle becomes in unspoken almost, catching the logical out to see it. Uh, and you have to go back to your answer to, to Paul, really. He says, look here. He says, how can that be? He says, you can't have a fountain sending out two waters. He says here, you can't have a fountain that sends out at the same place sweet water and bitter. You can't do it. Or he says, you can't have a fig tree bearing olives or a vine bearing figs. 
They said, a, a Saudi can't put out both salt and fresh water. See the logic? You've got something wrong, you can't both, we're not both, you see the point? You can't both, you're not both, you're one. Come on now, you're one fountain, you're the new fountain, you're the fountain of the spirit, and the pure fountain of the spirit produces the positive word about brothers and sisters as it does the positive word about God. And therefore, the other, not the fountain, it's a little mud coming on root, as the water throw out the fountain, you've got a little muddy on root, that's all. Don't mistake the mud for the fountain, you see? Back again, find out what you are. You're not a, a double person. You've not got double partialities or double estimates about uh, uh, who people are or, or uh, double questionings about uh, God's guidance and so on. You're not a double person. You're a single person. You're in the law of liberty. And so don't say you're double. Say you've got a pure fountain, affirm that you've got a pure fountain, a fountain of love. A fountain of appreciation. And we grow with it, we grow with it, we do it, we, I think as we go on, we a little more, a little more, we, we speak positively, and I find I check myself much quicker, I check much quicker than I said something now, I know I really, uh, that's quite unnecessary to put that side on that side, because I see, I should put God's side on another person. Well, you check up. Yeah, but that's not me. That's the, the other coming in, the false thing coming in, the double coming in through the, through the flesh, through the, uh, tempting me, to say something that my outer mind sees. And my outer tongue responds, that's not I. I say, that's not I. Don't take that. If it's said, it's forgiven. Don't take it. And, and stay on the positive. You're a fountain. A fountain can only produce one water. water. You're a tree. You only produce one kind of fruit. So you see, I catch it each time and brings them back out of the double, from the double mind, from the double... Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, that's it. All right? Uh, uh, involvement uh, into the signal. Um, and then he says, and there's a, there's a heavenly wisdom and a, and, and a hellish wisdom. Which comes down through the tongue. He says, have your conversation uh, in meekness of will. Have a good conversation. Uh, show your, uh, in, in, uh, it says, uh, now show out a good conversation your works in meekness of wisdom. Uh, heavenly wisdom. Uh, so that the, the, the outstream is mainly, it's pure, because it's genuine, it's peaceable. It's normally, um, it, it's meaning it's peace, but it can be entreated. Uh, you, can, you can listen to what people can say about what, what you're saying. It's producing peace. And it's uh, uh, sincere and honest and impartial. Um, and this, this, that's the sweetness of heaven coming through us. That's, the, that's, that's what's called the, the uh, wisdom from above. Uh, he doesn't say the wisdom from, from the, he only speaks about wisdom from above. He says, this wisdom, uh, the wisdom of this from above, is pure, and genuine, and peaceable, gentle, easy to be treated. That's the character. Gentle, easy, can accept words from other people and listen to what they say, uh, is genuine, is not partial, and this is peace. This is the heavenly wisdom. And we know it ourselves. We know it ourselves. This is the heavenly wisdom. This is Christ. In the way, ways we, sometimes the challenge comes, but we don't live, live peaceably. Sometimes you must move, as we see in Second Corinthians, sometimes you have to move to challenge. But you don't live, even then you do it with tears, as it were. Even then the point isn't the challenge as much as the love. But this is the heavenly wisdom, and we know it ourselves. He says there's another kind of wisdom. He doesn't give it, he just says that there's a, it doesn't descend, it doesn't descend from above, it doesn't say any more, it just doesn't descend, it that's, that's, well there's, um, the bitter envying and strife. What strife? We know it. Uh, when we, uh, what's his arguments? Envying is a bad word. Because we have it more than we think. I'm not so conscious of that one. Envying, uh, that, uh, um, uh, because uh, basically we uh, feel somebody has got more than we have or something. See, so that doesn't come and produces the, the discord. And so the real is the concord and the discord, isn't it? Generally speaking, uh, ours is a, as a word of concord, of peace, love, the other word is discord, watch it, watch it. And they say that produces uh, 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 peaceable fruits. By uh, uh, operating on the peace level, we produce, we, we produce a, a flow of life. Um, uh, the fruit of righteousness is shown by that, uh, meaning that uh, there's, there's harmony. Um, so that's what he said about tongue. Um, how about it? Well, 
a bit of try, I don't know, but there's a little more to say. We'd stop there for a moment. Uh, little more to do on James covering the last two chapters. Um, apparently among the believers uh, there's a great deal of um, worldly greed and competition going on. We'd almost think it's strange because we shouldn't. Perhaps I live in a kind of atmosphere where I don't meet that as it is, but here it was, and he was speaking to the believers and said, you get fighting among yourselves because you, 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 you have desires, you want certain things, and you would desire them, you can't get them, and then you even kill to get them, because you might kill the person's interpretation as well as their body to get them, and then you can't get them, and then you get fighting, and uh, uh, then you, you haven't got them because you ask, because you don't ask, then you can't get them when you do ask, you ask for wrong motives. A pretty gloomy picture. That's the first four verses of chapter three, because you're uh, out for your own self-interest. Of course, that wasn't true, you see. It's always the same thing. It's like they were captured by the flesh. And this, but apparently, it traces off very cut it does on some. So we have uh, desires, earthly desires, and, and uh, uh, ambitions, and covet decisions, for this and that. And even, uh, even uh, uh, use... Uh, get fighting our, fighting our neighbors about them, whether it was in church affairs or not. I wouldn't say so here. And, um, uh, and even using prayer as a means for getting what I want. This isn't a, uh, a, a passage on the technique of prayer, it's only on the misuse of prayer. Um, and then he comes right out and says, you see, uh, if you have any other love but Jesus, you're an adulterer. Straight out. This is where he says, you are adulterer, you adulterers, adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Who shall that with a friend of the world is enemy of God? No two measures. Um, so there's only one love. Your love isn't your husband or your wife or your children. It's only Jesus. It's only them as they're given to you by Jesus as, as form of which you can love, persons you can love. You know, we've got a soul lover and a soul uh, involvement in life. That's Jesus, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. If you have any rival love, it's an adultery. If you give way to it, of course, you can be tempted. Now, again, he doesn't touch that, but uh, 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 it doesn't even imply, imply that they went much farther than temptation here. And he'd be going in for things which were, were um, um, divided the uh, objectives in life. As he says, so, uh, get it clear, you can't have two loves. You can't love Jesus and then have, really be grabbed by some love of this, of this world. Maybe you do with finances or position or persons or family. You can't have it. So it's drastic. If you've got any other love to rival of Jesus, you're an adulterer. You're, you're, you're having an affair with another woman. You can't have that. So that's strong measure, isn't it? So perhaps we need it, even though we may say we don't seem to fit him exactly into fighting to get some personal energy. Yet you never know in life. A better money in business or better salary or bypassing this person or downgrading that person to be able to slip into his position. So these things can rise in subtle form, can't they? Uh, or, of course, uh, in friendships, rival because somebody wants to cut somebody else out of friendship. Or, or uh, as I say, even even the, uh, the wife and husband and the children taking uh, to uh, a place for Johnny Bond to Jesus as an as a, as a exclusive place for Jesus. Well, of course, if you're a union, you must have that. For you, is that. You, if you're not you, so poor you. If you're not you, but you're quite in you, you're finished. That, that you are, you are, you are that love. It isn't, a, it isn't really love with a person. It's like you are that person. It's this uh, admit the duality in you. It is that when you have unity, he isn't like you love him too. He's uh, people who don't know you get mistaken about that. They say, well, yeah, but I, I, I have God. And I'm going to meet him face to face. And Jesus, how can I say I'm one? You can't say it. You don't know it. But uh, it's, of course, the same principle of the Trinity. How is the Trinity one and yet three? They're one, yet they're three, yet they're one. So you can't argue with those that no duality. You only say they can only pick something up from you, you know that this is your, your, your centre of your peace and your, your, your sufficiency and all. I'm not I. I'm this person lived through me. 
Uh, and therefore, of course, I only have one love. I say, because I am that love. I'm mixed up in it. I can't have a rival love. I'm very tempted. I can't have it. If I don't know that, I can have rival loves. That's what you're getting at here. If you're those who have this divided outlook. I haven't recognized I have that divided outlook. It's a false thing. It was crucified with Christ. It's not real. The, uh, they have Christ, Christ has crucified the flesh with his affection for love. Uh, God forbid I should always say the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, but I am crucified the world, the world of me. I am crucified. John, uh, Galatians 3 times over, said, I'm crucified, the world's crucified, and I've crucified the flesh. So, they're not that real. What's crucified? It's, it's real to me. It's way up there. So, it's a, it's a, a falsely rival love, but it doesn't appear rival until I know this union. Then I say, ah, oh, I'm not that. So again, you'll come back. The only answer is to know the union. And because they didn't know you, and they were being caught up by some of these things, and to some extent they were uh, involved in the, uh, rival loyalties and uh, even twisty ways of doing things and gaining things, uh, which, uh, by which they can be said you're an adulterer. You, you're in love with another woman. That woman is the world. So it's good for us not to be searched, because we, I trust that we've been searched, but say, hey, I'm not, I don't accept that. Uh, I may have had temptations that way, I don't accept that. Or uh, we can appear to be caught out. This depends really. We may be real to us. We may really have a rival love and do battle with it. And our trouble is doing battle with it, of course, because we're mistaken an illusion for reality. So it is possible, if we don't know the union, that we are grabbed by a, a, a rival affection, uh, a rival anything. And uh, we know that. Uh, I've known that. I know that, but don't, don't take it. The point is, you take it, you fight, you fight it, you take it. And there it is. And um, you say, no, that's, that's not real. I just don't, that's not, the, the, I only have one love, there's God, and the, my love is to love people for their sake, not for my sake, or to love things for the advantage, not for my advantage, for uh, others' advantage, then you're free, because the other loves are always free. Um, so it may be, and they, and they, they were caught up by rival loves, and didn't know how to fight them, and they had to admit, falsely admit, that they were slaves, adulterers, uh, slaves for rival love. And so, in this case, uh, um, James does feel pretty graphically, rhythm. And he says there's got to be exposure and cleansing and humbling and crying out to God. Um, he says, uh, don't you know the, the spirit in the dwells in you lusted to envy? It's a queer phrase, and there are two interpretations. One is that it's our spirit lusting what it shouldn't. I don't think that's right. He says, don't you know the spirit of God in you lusting to get you right? He, he, he's, he's jealous for you being wrong, and he's there working on you. I like that it much more. It's, don't you know the Spirit of God working on you to, to deliver you from these false things? Um, and, then, and then he says, it's there because God gives abundance of grace. Um, God, uh, he says, he gives more grace, abundance of grace. And again, the second group, uh, second area of grace. He says, God, plenty of grace for God, of course, not explained. The grace we know is to be brought to the uh, recognition, affirmation of the union, the, the realization of the union, then the illusion of the other. It's just in the cross, but they, he doesn't explain that. He said, but God does give grace, he said, and, he, and um, he said, but you've got to humble yourself. You, all right? We're hopeless as believers, they were humble. We hope that they were, it doesn't imply they were. But they knew they had no business to have these rival loves. So uh, God resists the power, but if you come down and say, yeah, I shouldn't have it, now you're starting. Then you submit it to God, and they say, if you do that, the devil, you resist the devil, because there's submission to resistance. When you can't see two ways, you switch yourself to God, you can't, just the devil, not busy, you don't see him, he's gone. So the devil's out. He was put out by, he was put out, uh, uh, and his works were destroyed by Jesus Christ. And uh, so we're not, we have nothing to say to the devil, he's out. Uh, but we, we resist him by affirming who we are, not by fighting him. The more you fight the thing, the more you make it real. We resist, the more you resist the thing, the more you affirm it. That's why you don't answer temptation by resisting it. You say, no, uh, uh, it's not there. Um, uh, that's why I use that, that phrase that Jesus used in the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount. He said, if, you're, um, uh, um, uh, if uh, your adversary, he said, agree with your adversary quickly, why is he in the way with you? Your adversary is someone opposing you. Because you don't reveal, uh, agree with him, he'll grab you and put you in prison until you pay the utmost farthing. And the idea is, if you if you um, uh, fight your adversary and your, uh, your temptation, uh, something that grabs you, you fight him, he gets you. This is the end of tape one. Please continue to tape two.
Our hearts are purified. But they've got to find out. They've got to go this way, maybe, in a period when they've got to get things cleaned up. We've got to cry to God. It is the way he says, stop, stop being happy. He's strong. He says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Stop your laughter. Turn your laughter into mourning and you're joy to heaven. Just humble yourself in front of God and he lifts you up. So there are, uh, sometimes, the people have to do business. That there are black uh, That's why I use that, that phrase that Jesus used in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says, um, uh, um, uh, if uh, your adversary, he said, if you adversary quickly, why is he in the way with you? Your adversary is someone opposing you. Because you don't reveal, uh, agree with him, he'll grab you and put you in prison until you pay the utmost farthing. And the idea is, if, you're, if you um, uh, fight your adversary or, and your temptation, uh, something you grabs you, you fight him, he gets you. Put you in prison, you say, okay, you're there, but you're not really there. Okay, I'm tempted, but that's not what I really am at all. And you, you agree with him, but so he can't touch you. You say, you're there, I'm, I don't take you, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the other uh, in Christ. So you resist the devil by um, uh, submitting to God and, and drawing nigh to God. And but he does say, he says, he says, cleanse your hands, he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. You've got the word double-minded comes in again there. Afflicted, mourn and weep. See, again, he doesn't say how. Our hearts are purified. But they've got to find out. They've got to go this way, maybe a period where they've got to get things cleaned up. They've got to cry to God. It is the way he says, stop, stop being happy. He's strong. He says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Stop your laughter. Turn your laughter into mourning and you're joy to heaven. Just humble yourself in front of God and he lift you up. So there are uh, sometimes that people have to do business. That there are break breaks and aren't there when people have been broken, they have to admit I've been wrong. I'm on the wrong part. God have mercy on because start even I'm a Christian and uh, find a way. Uh, because the actual fact when you get there, you don't purify your heart, it's purified by faith. The great scripture on purity heart is Acts fifteen. Uh, those who don't know the union still bring up that, that the Jeremiah statement. Oh, I get it all the time. Oh, but the heart is sickly wicked above all who can know it. That's, that's, that's unsaved, of course, your heart's like that. You know, that's not saved. When, uh, um, when you're saved, your heart isn't uh, wicked and sickly wicked above all things. It's glorified. Uh, Acts 15 says that, that this is, the, when you have the Holy Ghost, this is what happens to you. You know it. Um, um, uh, uh, Peter speaking of, of the bit of Cornelius. Um, God which knoweth the heart, bear the witness, give him the Holy Ghost as he did with us, putting the difference between us and then purifying the heart by faith. And the word in the Greek said, air is kept, which means the thing done and finished. Purified, done and finished. That's Acts 15, 9. Uh, why? Because, of course, a, a, a pure thing is a thing which is single. I mean, it, it, uh, pure water, you don't see, there are foreign matters, you can't really see any foreign matters, it's like pure water, it looks, it looks like that anyhow, pure, single. So uh, 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 a pure heart, a single heart, uh, and when, when, of course, we moved into union with Christ, we were a single heart, because uh, uh, our hearts have been, uh, his, his love shed more in our hearts, and we, the love of God taken us over, and we've got the single heart, which is God and his love, and so on, this, this is a single heart. The actual fact is, everybody has a pure heart, depends which way. Kitty God is a great, great book on that, on heart, purity of heart. Purity of heart to will one thing. Purity of heart to, the heart is where you choose, you, you will one thing, that's purity of heart. Now we used to will self, so we were pure of heart for the devil. If you were pure of heart for the devil, not you pure of heart for God. And Jesus Christ cut that off when he died on our behalf. Died and took out this, this false love. Uh, that's a sin, the false love. And there came in the new love. Now we ch the, the change of purity. Our hearts are now single. If our heart is single for God, well, it was the other way around. So the actual essence, you don't purify your heart. I suppose he means more in the, in the set of the affections there, but the actual purity the, is you are pure. You're made pure in Christ. So he speaks strong words to the man. There, there may be the time when that um, uh, uh, type of heart searching and breaking down and uh, Confession, restoration on the uh, stepping stone in in this way. Actually, we all do it. If you come into union somewhere, you've been this way somewhere. Well, you search and thought and, 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 and uh, been mixed up with self condemnation, so until finally the truth has been revealed to us. Uh, that's the last of the doubles he mentions. Um, uh, then he adds a few more, and the way he does different comments. 
he again uh, mentioned, comes back and says, on this tongue, he's very sensitive about the tongue, about speaking even about one another. He hadn't actually said this before, uh, 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 but he says uh, uh, it's here, but uh, don't speak even about your brother. And he puts it in this way he does, unusual way, makes you think. Um, if you speak evil of a brother, you judge the brother, then the brother, you're speaking evil of the law. That's a curious statement. Don't speak evil of one another, brethren. If you speak evil of your brother, and judge your brother, you speak evil of the law. Uh, and judge the law. But if you judge the law, it's not a doer, the law will a judge. Now, of course, our old idea of the law, you see, is something out here. And it doesn't make sense you judge the law out here. But, of course, you see, we are the law. What he means is, uh, the perfect law of liberty. If I judge a brother, and that brother is an expression of this law of liberty, I'm judging the law which is which is about, which he's expressing. I'm not judging him. I'm judging that which he expresses. So don't judge a brother. Uh, that's God's business. If if he uh, if he's the one who claims at least that he's that he's uh, Christ's person and so on, no, don't judge him. He's claiming all that. That's Christ taking him that way. They're Christ taking him that way. Don't judge him. If you're judging, you're spirit of the law. He's being controlled by the law. The law is, of course, one and seven. God in him. That's the law. The law of liberty. It's the living God who is the law of the universe. Express in him. A judge of that. So it's another subtle way around of saying, now, when you judge a person, you're judging that which motivates the person. That which motivates the person is Christ in that person. So you're judging Christ in your spirit of Christ. But why? Don't leave that alone. Just leave Christ to, to do his own merciful positive edifying operation in life he's never because he's never destructive um he says there's one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy and so on who uh who out there judges another and then he slips off to another uh area as he keeps wandering in his mind around there he knows his people where uh, there was a slapping up and that was a casualness in in in, uh, in recognizing living a guided life well we would again say that's not thing that us much uh, he's saying, now, uh, you people, don't you be people who say, well, now tomorrow I'll go to Sun City and I'll stay there a year and I'll make money. If the idea is I'll get my own game there. And you don't, and you, but you don't want to know where it is tomorrow. And he says, you're actually like, so a vapor. So the, the spirit of time vanishes away. And you ought to say, it's the Lord will. Uh, you live and do this and that. The, the, the rejoice in your own choice and your own boasting, that, that, that's, uh, um, that's evil. Um, so he's saying, he says to this, I would think that we who moved into this life, have that normal. We don't always say it's the Lord's will, but we mean it. At bottom, we're always meaning to do what we understand to be Lord's will. We aren't casually going to, I'm going to offer a big game to, to hoot about God. So again, there's a division here, the d- double-mindedness. If you're in the one, we aren't always saying the Lord wills, the Lord wills. You're just uh, taking that to be said something. You say it because you think the Lord will. You say take, you take it for granted all, but underneath your, in your, uh, your, in your inner conscious life, you know, as far as you understand, it's all being God um, acting through you, whatever his ways are. But, well, in a double life, again, you get it. Uh, that comes in this, this false motive, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm a sub, I, I could make some money there, I'll go and get on with that for years' time. I haven't even consulted God. That's what he's getting at. And you, you uh, enjoy the fact that you may be able to make some cash on the side or something. Whatever it may be. He said, this is evil. Um, he uh, has a, a final pa- passage then, again on the rich. Again, it doesn't seem to come close to us, because um, uh, it speaks of rich men in their worst form, as well as accumulating masses of money, and it, it, it says it rust on them and burn them, and those who get their money by uh, 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 cheap labor. So there's a certain social touch here. Uh, the, uh, the higher the laborers who reap down your fields cry out against you, and it comes in the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, the Holy Host, rather than the Old Testament idea. Um, you haven't paid them their wages, or again you use your you use your, your money for your own sensualities. Uh, you live in pleasure, uh, you're wanton, uh, nourish your heart, and so on. Um, and you condemn and kill the just to make your way. This is a picture, of course, of there's plenty of it in the world, there's been plenty through history, haven't there? Obviously, riches are a, 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 a danger, how hard they shall live, which is Jesus said so, that's so. So it may not very directly appeal to us here, but uh, maybe uh, it, it helps us to watch, to see what, what, that we're good stewards of what we have got. 
But what is his point was here, they're storing up this wealth, it'll burn you one day, it'll turn the curse you, it's rust on you, you store up your wealth, instead of using your wealth. You've got it wrongly, you use it wrongly. Um, that's all I suppose we'd say as far as we're concerned there, that, uh, that uh, insofar as we have any prosperity, that our privilege is to see how, our how um, what we're prospered with can be the benefit of God and His, uh, his purposes in the world. And then he moves on to a, a word, a final word from patience. Um, there was a persecution, now again, it doesn't touch us these days very much. There was a patience for the coming of the Lord. Um, uh, the idea being, of course, they were under uh, different pressures, they would be, uh, look for the Lord's coming. But we find when we read Paul, Paul did that, it was under great pressures, he longed to go. Um, uh, but he likens, uh, likens our condition uh, waiting for the coming of the Lord to uh, the um, to Job particularly, this is where Job was mentioned, and to the prophets who suffered affliction and had patience, and, and they said you you kind of you're happy in enduring. That's a good phrase in chapter 11, in verse 11. You are, you're happy in you endure. You heard of the patience of Job. Uh, Job got so much better. So remember, patience didn't mean uh, it, 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 it included joy. I mean, Job came back to a joyful life and. Can we praise what we're doing? Uh, so let's be more occupied, I would say, praising the Lord now and being occupied in the present coming um, and be having fulfillment for God will do by our present coming than to be too much occupied in the in the future coming. We must each go the way we're led that way. Um, many of God's people are enormously intrigued by the uh, second coming. I think they say that uh, uh, that book uh, by Lynn... Lin, 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 that's gone into two million copies, hasn't it? To my mind, a lot of it is just cinema movies, is just Christian movies. You see, that's my nice picture. See, I don't want to live a detached life. I don't want to live with what's going to happen one day. I'm living very much what's happening now. So I don't personally wish to be too interested in that. It'd be wonderful when he comes to kind of perfection. I'm not, that's not my basis. And yet I find, on the whole, it is the main and basis of most of evangelicals. It's an interesting what they can say about the tribulation and the judgment coming in. And it also makes you very negative. It makes you think that God's judging this world. Well, if he is, it's a pretty good lot of blessing packed up in the judgment, so I can say. Because this is a day of blessing. A, a day which we're able to move out with the gospel. A day of freedom. A day of response. It's a tremendous day worldwide. I'm not going to mission affairs now. I'm a, I'm a missionary. Everybody knows mission affairs knows that. Tremendous days in Brazil and Africa and Indonesia and even countries like uh, and Japan are moving and Thailand, all over the world. The Spirit of God moving through the people. So there's streams of blessing today. And I think that's more to my mind in the foreground than the judgment. That's why personally I, I, I somewhat doubt their interpretations. In fact, in the present working out, as they for 50 years said they had, I mean, they said the kind of thing, when I was a boy I heard these kind of things just happening. Well, it hasn't happened. And instead of that, it's coming great and large with the work of the Spirit of God. So I'm more occupied than that. And nor do I think we ought to be saying we should escape the tribulation. Uh, I, I was linked with a great soldier, C.G. Studd, who, who believed in soldiering for Jesus and gave the highest honor to suffer for Jesus and give a life for it. So uh, he was so contemptuous of those who want to escape the tribulation. He had a beautiful society for those who want to escape the great tribulation, but no one joined it. <laughs> he said, go through the tribulation, glory in God, and these glories in your suffering. Let people see Christ coming through you in your, in your suffering. That's much more the, the tone of the Bible, I think, than having a tribulation, oh, good, I should go up, I don't mind what happens to the people left behind, I should go. That's not the, that's not the gospel. Escape, it's being with them. So I doubt the whole presentation myself. I think it's more speculation than interpretation, or so-called interpretation than necessary truth. But others don't see that. So God bless, follow what you got. And if you're one who gets crazy about this, well, give what you got and use what you got, and God does use it. Uh, many people have been uh, brought face to face, they need a Christ through the preaching of the second coming. So there's room for everything. Um, it moves on to just a final word or two. Um, a little touch on language again, don't swear. Now, he isn't talking about vile language. When Jesus said, don't swear, and, put, and here he gave it, put above all there, he said in verse, don't swear. Now that by heaven, what he's referring to is um, uh, 
the act, the weakness which involves in saying a thing and having to have something to confirm it. That's really what it is. It's, it's, a, it's an admission of, that you're not confident in what you're saying. Don't have to put in something um, uh, as, a, as a confirmation. By God I say this. Because we wouldn't say that. The world says that. Or by Jesus. Or we may use different phrases. Which really, uh, we use uh, sort of to confirm our word. And uh, John says, James says, yeah, and they're good enough. That if you're sure, just say what's true and say the truth. And yes or no. You don't have to add this because you're a little weak and, and need some little confirmation to put it on the side. That's all he means there. Um, and then he has this, this uh, well-known uh, statement on sickness, um, which I think has a considerable subtlety in it. He's saying that if you're, if you're sick, you pray, um, practical, if you're merry, sing, sing psalms, sing songs. Uh, if you're sick, What does it say? It says, if you're sick, if you want to have, if you want to have outer symbolic help, symbolism, call the elders, and uh, not they call you, you call them, and uh, uh, get them to pray over you, and get them to anoint you with oil, them the Lord. The prayer says, so save, not heal. Isn't that a little twist? It didn't say the prayer of faith should heal the sick. He said, the prayer of faith does say the sick. Um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and the Lord to raise him up. Raising up isn't necessarily physical. And if he has have committed sin, they should have given him. The center was getting in a healing. The center wasn't the physical healing. It's the Lord will save you and put you into, into, a, into a saved relationship, a liberated relationship. If you've got sins are blocked away, they disappear. So that's free in Christ. And that's what really matters that our true health is being in Christ. And when we're in Christ, that may come down to the body. And he doesn't use the words we use, uh, to say, uh, speak, um, then it speaks, uh, it seems to turn generally then, not to necessarily to the sick person. He adds, then, confess your false one to another, um, uh, and pray for one another. That's going beyond the question of the elders and the sick person. It moved into a new section now, I think, although we use the good deal together. Uh, pray for one another, you may be healed, and they speak about the affection of firm prayer. Uh, uh, the body, what does the matter body matter? The healing is to be healed as a whole person, a whole person, a person for whom Christ is manifested. And it may be through a sick body or, or not through a sick body. Physical is, is, is uh, a minor matter. Uh, you find Paul may read a lot of it. Uh, after all, can you get a better? Well, uh, one of the teachers and he, he said, my outer man perishes. My inner man is renewed day by day. And uh, he says, uh, the Christ will magnify my body, whether by life or by death. So he didn't say, I shan't die. He said, I, 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 all I said, that, that I die glorifying Christ, magnifying Christ. And of course, uh, uh, it's all in the flesh which comes up in St. Corinthians. So I only mention that I, 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 I don't believe the major point is a person to be healed in their body. Of course, we're human, and we're hurt, and we want healing, but if you look into this, the, the, the danger is the first objective, I want healing. So we're back on services again. Isn't the first thing, I want the will of God. I'm God. God's living me. I want the will of God. And Paul, very plainly, only really almost eight to see it, warned us that there's not... Um, final healing of the body in your life. And Romans 8 is the victory chapter. The more than conquerors and so on. And that's where he brings it right in the middle. He says, yes, the world's traveling until he gets released through the sons of God. And um, uh, we are heirs and co-heirs. And we're more than conquerors, he says in his chapters. We're more than conquerors who have loved us. Uh, then he says, the world groans and travels in pain until the final release comes. Not only they, but ourselves also. Romans 8.23 which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, to the redemption of our body. We say by hope, hope to see is not hope. What a man seeth, why do we yet hope for? If we hope that which we see not, then we will patience wait for it. So the salvation by faith of the Spirit, the salvation by hope of the body. He doesn't say salvation by faith of the body, it's salvation by hope of the body. So we're not given, uh, a, a total redemption of the body now. So why bother about the body? Why not just occupy and see whatever I am, Christ is coming through my body? Actual fact is, 
uh, when we've healed spirits, uh, it does affect us, but there's a quickening goes on. The word that, that Paul does give is quickening. Quickening isn't healing, it's life in spite of the condition. Quicken body. It's also quickening or mortal body. It says shell. Probably the real meaning of that verse is the resurrection again, but it, we often use it. And I think it's true to say that uh, when we're at rest and peace and joy and free spirit, it does affect our bodies. We're not thinking, we're not fussing about our bodies, and it's spontaneous. It things happen which quicken our bodies and sometimes give healing. Um, so I don't see it. The, the, the New Testament is, is um, putting an emphasis on physical healing that's all from here. And finally he says, prayer does get answered. He makes a final reference to Elijah, as we had this morning. You can pray and get answered. And the highest thing of all, it can be a means you can bring other people back to Christ. Can uh, convert the spirit from there which way. So he keeps adding these little categories. And there he finishes. This ends. No, no other ending. No final greeting like Paul would give. And uh, that's his letter. So that's what we've got to say, James. We hope, you, we hope you won't mind our including on this tape some of Dan Stone's thoughts on freedom that he shared with a group in uh, Louisville in 76. I'm very much this morning like a guy who was being tarred and feathered and ridden out of town with a reporter asked him what he thought and he said if it wasn't for the honor of it he'd rather not be here. One thing about teaching, unfortunately it requires the English language for those of us who speak American. And the very use of English language tends to complicate that which is not that complicated. Uh, for instance, I could say what I really want to say in one sentence, and that would be a blessing. But I've done that before and then I get the riot act read to me for not taking any longer. So I'll go ahead and uh, try to drag this thing out. This is new material that I haven't used before. I have notes and I hate it. I don't want to use them, but I don't want to. Get, I don't want to say uh, off center what I mean to say on center. I, I'm afraid you're going to hear it as law and it's inner principle and not out of law. And I always have to trust that hearing. But. Uh, what I want to talk about this morning is does union life encourage license? And of course the one sentence answer to that is what others call license we call growing pains. Because we don't see outer, we see inner. And what is inner is already done. And the only place it's worked out though is in the outer. And there is this period in our lives, it's not chronologically ordered at all, but it is confined to this arena of time and space where we now find ourselves in our humanity. And it does require us coming into an awareness of our fixed inner consciousness. Until we move into a real fixed inner consciousness, uh, we do have periods. Uh, someone was talking about their, their uh, earthen vessel a while ago. We do have uh, periods of exaggerated concern with the vessel. And we do have periods where we are really seeing uh, separation again, outwardly. And we do have problems from time to time with this. So I want to uh, share it with you today and uh, see where it, uh, where it takes us. I hope you will allow me to refer from time to time to notes. I appreciate uh, something that's happened already today because uh, Bill was using passages of Scripture from 2 Corinthians this morning a great deal and I've already found some 2 Corinthians passages and Laurie's ones on telephone. Okay. So maybe we'll be using the same, some of the same uh, material. Well, does union life encourage license? My immediate and first response is geared to the one that Paul gave in the 6th chapter of Romans, the 15th verse. Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. But the question is a natural one for this day and time in which we're living. For we all have just 
been a part of a decade which was very permissive in the outer conduct, and the permissiveness became the new form of conformity. And if you were uh, permissive, you had your own peer group that uh, applauded you and awarded you for being permissive, while your parents uh, stayed home and wept because you were uh, to them permissive and were not conforming. But of course, to the other group, uh, you were very, con uh, very much of a conformer. Now we're seeing it in our generation, uh, the decade we're now in, we're seeing our society more willing to accept structure. Uh, really, we're seeing our society more willing to accept control upon themselves. And in religious circles, we're, we're hearing that uh, word bounced around about discipline and submission, which is nothing more than our desire for someone to tell us what to do, how to do it, when we can do it, and how often we can do it. We do it one more time, it's wrong. <laughs> but the outer conduct is something of a trickster. For we really know that we cannot trust outer conduct to produce inner spiritual life and character. It never has. I'm always aware of the word never, but it never has and it never will. It will produce outer conformity, but it also produces a great deal of inner nonconformity. And we all know the difficulty of living in that duality. At the same time we're conforming outwardly, quite often there is deep within us an unsettledness and a dissatisfaction and a great deal of nonconformity that kind of has the lid twisted down on it tightly and as that pressure builds up inside of us, uh, sometimes it bursts and when it does, it splatters all over the place. So we can't trust out of conformity to produce in a character. No way. But we know that we all start, and this is within the Christian framework, we all start with outer conduct. We all start hearing about the Christ who died for us, the Christ of the past and the Christ of the future. And that is the outer Christ. And we, we make our initial response to the, to the gospel that's presented to us. My very body movements illustrate that that concept is outer and the word is presented to us and we hear the word and we, we respond. There's a great sense of relief and relief that our sins have been forgiven. So we all start there. But we know that the sequence of spiritual truth is from outer to inner. And we're never really fixed in anything that's outer. Uh, we can always be swayed from outer teaching. We cannot be moved from inner truth. Because inner truth is my I, my pronoun I. And when I am expressing that, as Bill was saying this morning, that's me. That's when my me is my I. And I, in an essence, that's what I'm really leading into today that there is a period in here when our me isn't really tracking with our I. And we know it. And we're concerned about it. And we're seeking to bring uh, these uh, two concepts, these two uh, tracks, so to speak, in line with each other so that our, our, our I always coincides with the Word of God that is being spoken to our inner person. Um, first, let us talk about it like this. For a time, to many people, union life may appear to encourage license. And this is important to discuss because if you've been involved in this any length of time at all. First of all, you probably asked that question yourself, or you probably made that accusation yourself about union life. If you've been in it very long, someone's made it to you. Now, the reason we said that and others say it to us 
I've already alluded to. We begin to hear truth, but we don't hear truth inwardly first. We hear truth here. We hear truth through this ear, or we look at truth as through our outer eye, and we begin to see outer conduct entirely. For people like this, probably 2 Corinthians 4.18 should be translated something like this. We look at the things which are seen, but not at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are important and permanent, but the things that are not seen are foolishness and not worth pursuing seriously. That's where we all start. The first thing we want to know after conversion is, now what must I do? This is the end of side one. Please stop your machine and turn the tape over.